Hello and welcome to Alan History Nerd. This video is going to look at UK politics, in particular the structure, role and powers of the executive. So the executive branch of government in the UK is headed by the Prime Minister uh, and the Cabinet and it controls all the different uh, departments, uh, government departments like the Education Department, Health Department, Ministry of Defence, all that kind of stuff. So it's a really important part of, U, uh, of the UK political system and this is an important part of component two of A-level politics. So uh, this is, as I said, this is from component two of A-level politics at Excel, uh, and it, it is section 3.1, the structures, role and powers of the executive. So this asks us to look at, and this is what I'm going to look at in the video today, its structure, including the prime minister, the cabinet, junior ministers and government departments, the main roles, including proposing legislation, proposing a budget and making policy decisions within laws and budget. And then finally, the main powers of the executive, including royal prerogative powers, initiation of legislation and secondary, secondary legislative power. So it's quite a mixture of stuff in here. And really, it's just highlighting the main powers and position of the executive within our system. Now, the UK system is a slightly odd one politically, because what we have is a fusion of powers where the executive actually sits inside the legislature and, and controls it, actually. Um, and, and so the, the powers of the parliament and the executive, it's, it's quite confused. They're kind of crunched in together, which is very different to when you have a separate executive like you have in the US, where you have a president who's elected separately from legislature and he has a cabinet which he, he or she selects themselves and doesn't, they cannot sit inside the legislature. So the UK system is very different. So it's really important that this builds on an understanding of parliament. And there, again, there is a whole section on my, um, on my A-level politics playlist, which looks at Parliament uh, separately. Uh, and this part, we're going to start looking at the executive. So the structure of the executive, uh, the prime minister and cabinet starts off with. So, so the key figure at the top of all of this is, is the prime minister. So they are head of the executive or chief of chief executive. Uh, and they chair cabinet meetings and, and set the agenda within cabinet. Uh, and the cabinet is selected by the prime minister, uh, as are the, the junior ministers who, who work in, in the, the different departments under the cabinet member. And, and they have specific roles. And we'll look at this in, in, a, in a bit more in a, a minute, where it kind of shows the breaks down of how those roles work. Now, the prime minister, therefore, has this incredible power of patronage and is helped by the, the whip's office uh, to, to make these decisions. They might recommend people uh, to put into the, these different uh, positions and therefore actually <clears throat> positions in cabinet are often down to uh, high levels of loyalty uh, and fealty shown to uh, the prime minister. But when the prime minister is selecting, they have to select their ministers from the two houses of parliament. So they, they have to come out of either the House of Commons or the House of Lords. We do see occasionally somebody who is outside those being uh, hurriedly uh, made a Lord um, so that they, they are in one or other of the houses. As well as the actual main cabinet, which which can meet as a whole group, there are a series of cabinet committees. Now, these make decisions on key areas. So, for example, there's a National Security Council and that makes decisions on national security. There was a uh, there's a COVID-19 strategy which which plans out the government policies on COVID. There's a climate action Impl implementation committee, which makes sure make sure that all the um, the, the the laws and things made made regarding uh, climate change are being enacted properly and, and a select member of, uh, of ministers will sit on those committees sometimes they're headed by the prime minister sometimes they aren't uh, the Prime Minister can create a new department. So, um, for example, uh, we saw the creation of the Department for Exiting the European Union being created. Um, th they can abolish them and we've seen it being abolished. Um, we can see the merging uh, of departments. So, for example, uh, the Department for International Development was um, merged with the Foreign Commonwealth Office. So, and, and, and all these departments have huge numbers of civil servants and people working for them. So, in terms of seats on the cabinet it might not seem gigantically important but it's a whole huge mechanism underneath all of that and so the merging of departments can be a really big deal setting up a, 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 a department from scratch can be a really big deal 
The cabinet is made up of uh, 20 to 23 senior to 23 senior ministers. Uh, they're supported by the cabinet office, which is a branch of the civil service, uh, which is headed by the cabinet secretary. And that is the top, top job uh, that you can get in the civil service. So if you're aiming for careers in the future in the civil service, that's the that's the pinnacle of what you can aim for. So the cabinet makes decisions on key areas of policy and it has what we call collective responsibility. So, so once any decision has been made, no matter how you voted or argued in the cabinet meeting, you must then publicly defend uh, that decision made by cabinet. And again, the, the tradition in the UK is, is that if a prime minister was to lose a cabinet vote, they then should at that point resign. Now, obviously, that should be a fairly unlikely event, given that the cabinet is selected by the prime minister. So normally the people that the, the prime minister thinks will largely um, do what they want them to do. And again, one of the accusations against, against Boris Johnson has been that he, he, he essentially has created himself uh, a cabinet of people who are going to go along with... Um, with what he wants and those who, who potentially were arguing against him have all been kind of um, sidelined. Uh, government departments then are not just the minister at the top. Uh, so underneath them, we have junior ministers uh, and um, a whole whole heap of, of civil servants and other people. And then connected to the department, often we have these executive agencies. So uh, at the top is a senior minister, a secretary of state, uh, and they, they will have responsibility for a very broad area. So defense or transport or education. Or, or health, or whatever the ministry is. Each ministry heading a department is supported by junior ministers. I'm going to give the example of the education ministry. So uh, the education minister, as I'm making this video, is Gavin Williamson. He's, he's managed to get through the last couple of years without getting sacked, so it, I'm assuming that he'll still be there for a little while after I've made the video. Uh, and then under Gavin Williamson in, in the education ministry, there are five junior ministers. And they, they have then what narrower areas of specific responsibility. So these include uh, the Minister for State, uh, for State for Universities, uh, which is Michelle uh, Donlan, uh, and the Minister of State for School Standards, who, who's Nick Gibb. So <clears throat> they will then focus on that very narrow area and they'll report up to this, the senior minister, who, who then has a kind of the overarching view of what's going on. A bit like you might, for example, have it in, in, in where I work in a college structure. You have the senior leadership team at the top and then they will have areas of responsibility. And under them, there will be different faculties and the faculty will have a head. And then within that, you might have course leaders and things like that. So it kind of breaks down. Uh, so at the very top, you would have the education minister. Then you would have uh, the Minister of State for Universities, the Minister of State for School Standards, uh, and, and, and then the layer down again, again uh, uh, part of the junior ministers are, are the parliamentary undersecretaries. Um, so, for example, Vicky Ford is parliamentary undersecretary for children and the families. And so they, they kind of they rank, rank so we slightly lower the Minister of State. So you might start as a um, an undersecretary, you might then become a Minister for State, and then you might end up eventually um, sat in the Cabinet. So the, the departments also oversee executive agencies. So, for example, a really good example of this one you might have come across, it across is the DVLA, which is overseen by the Department for Transport. Now, I'm always amazed at quite how many of these different agencies there are. So there are some that you will know, like the DVLA. But again, as part of my research I, for this, I saw that the, there are actually, for example, the health department alone oversees 29 of these agencies. So <laughs> there are, again, the, the, the size of government, uh, and on all these different mechanisms for carrying out these actions are, are really quite extensive. Another role uh, of the executive is proposing legislation. Uh, and most bills in Parliament are pu what we know as public bills, and these come from the executive. Uh, the Queen's speech at the start of each Parliament sets out the government priorities for that session. So in 2019, the, the Queen's uh, speech largely dealt with Brexit, but also covered issues of law and order, as well as the NHS and the environment. Uh, and and these these things that are set out in the Queen's speech, they might come from the party's manifesto. They don't necessarily have to. Uh, the the government might um, consult with pressure groups or other interested groups when they're putting uh, putting uh, legislation uh, together. Uh, and there's often a very important role played by special advisers, and they can help. Uh, devise these things. So, for example, Dominic Cummins, who, who more recently, famously, uh, was, was kind of the special advisor to the Prime Minister. Boris Johnson, previous to that, he was special advisor to Michael Gove. So, a lot of the kind of the changes that came through with GCSEs and A levels, a lot of that again linked back to Dominic Cummings. 
Uh, the executive can also use uh, secondary legislation to develop their policies and the functions of the department. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at all of that in a bit more detail later on. Another important role of the executive is proposing a budget. And, and, and this is set out by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who's Richie Sunak at the moment. And, and they, will, they set out what the government is going to do in terms of taxation and public spending. In the, in the budget, the Chancellor also sets how how they expect the economy to perform. They predict things like levels of inflation. They predict any changes of what's going to happen to government debt. And um, generally, it's going to go up. So, for example, the 2020 budget, including a, a freeze on income tax bans, meaning if there is any uh, wage inflation, this will lead to an increase in, in tax revenue uh, for the government. Uh, there's a five, uh, five billion pound emergency response fund for the NHS and, and the other public sectors uh, to deep dive into due to, to the COVID crisis. Um, there was at a, a long last the scrapping of the 5% uh, 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 VAT on tampons. Um, they, there was an extra 27p put on a, a packet of cigarettes. I have no idea how much they now are, but uh, again, tax on that keeps on going up. Um, alcohol, alcohol taxes didn't go up, fuel duties didn't go up. And the government expected that in this, this year there will be economic growth of 1.1%, inflation 1.4%. Uh, the government would borrow um, 14.6 billion more this year than it had previously forecast and so on. So the, we, we see a whole range of stuff. And again, there's, and, and, and there'll keep being more and more budgets. And again, it's a really important moment in politics whenever there's a budget. It's something to, to, to keep a, a close eye on. Another part of the, the role of the executive is making policy decisions within laws and budget. So this is all about the direction the, the government chooses to take a, a, the country in. So this can include things like deciding to re reform things like the welfare uh, um, uh, the, the welfare system. So, for example, we've seen uh, the introduction of universal credit it could be to do with reforming the education system. So, for example, changes to A-levels and GCSEs, the setting up of free schools. It could be um, changes to the NHS. Or over time, we've seen things like the introducing and removing of internal markets. Um, the executive, in terms of the most important part of this, really, is, is that these are day-to-day decisions in running the country. So Parliament does the big bit, making the laws, but the the actual kind of nitty gritty day to day, what what we're going to, how we're going to respond to this, that is done by 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 the executive, the key part of government. Uh, and, and so all the stuff we've seen with responses to the COVID crisis, with the roadmap to ending restriction, all that kind of stuff, that's all done uh, uh, through this this particular role of the executive. The main powers of the executive, then, well, the first one of these I'm going to look at is, is the royal prerogative, which doesn't sound like it should hold, sit with the executive at all. It sounds like it should sit with the monarch. Well, actually, if we go back far enough in time, the executive was headed by the monarch. Well, it isn't anymore. But these are powers that did originally sit with the monarch. So if you go back to, I don't know, Tudor times, then these are the kind of powers that sat there uh, with Henry VIII and, and, and monarchs like that. They have now been transferred to the prime minister and cabinet. So they include things like um, the, the power to appoint ministers, we've seen already, um, the granting of legal pardons, um, signing of treaties, declaring war and using the armed forces, awarding honours. The monarch does choose some of those personally, but most of those are done by the government, largely to the friends and donors. Um, and taking uh, emergency action at times of crisis. So, for example, it's law and order, it's a, in, introducing curfews or, 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 or things like that. Now, some powers have come more under the control of Parliament. There was an idea that, that really this executive power was, was, was a bit unchecked and was a bit too extensive. So, for example, following um, what was going on with the Iraq war, there was concern about a declaration of war, military action, that, that, that should have some kind of parliamentary oversight. Some powers um, the executive tried to give away completely. So, for example, um, under the coalition government, we got the 2011 Fixed Term Parliament Act, and the idea of that was one of, one of the prerogative powers that the executive had was deciding when elections were uh, within uh, within that remit, which was five years. Now, the set Parliament Act was supposed to take that power off them because it gave them an advantage. It's not been a great success, um, largely because uh, we've had elections more frequently than we should have done, and the government still seems to be able to force its way through because it just stares at the opposition going, really, you don't want an election? We thought you would want an election, and things like that. And I, I think the, the Fixed and Parliament Act is likely to get scrapped when government has time, when there aren't um, kind of Brexit happening and COVID happening and stuff like that. It, it's, it's definitely on the list of things that the Conservative government want to do. 
Another important power uh, of the executive is initiation of legislation. I talked a little bit about this earlier. So, and again, in my parliament videos, particularly the one on, on legislation, it goes through the legislative process in, in a lot more detail. The executive dominates parliamentary time, and that, that's really what you need to pass legislation. Um, so there are 13 days for private members' bills. There are 20 days of opposition. All the rest of parliamentary time belongs to the government, to the executive. Um, and normally, um, using patronage and the whip's office and majorities in the House of Commons, uh, then the government gets what it wants. Um, so it can be confident of passing the legislation it wants to, unless there's a rebellion uh, on the government backbenches, because at the moment there's a, a Conservatives have got a majority of 80, so it'd have to be a fairly enormous rebellion for it to halt anything. Without a majority, uh, the government finds life much, much harder, or with a small major majority, it finds life much harder as well. So a recent example we've had with a, a minority government, 2017 to 2019, kind of really highlights the fact that at that point, the government doesn't really dominate the passing of legislation because we saw huge numbers of stuff uh, being blocked by Parliament. Uh, now, another one of the main powers is secondary legislation. And this one, again, is quite controversial. Uh, so it's law made without passing a, a new act of parliament. It, it's normally through something called a statutory instrument, and it norm, normally they're used to modify existing legislation. Now, a lot of them isn't, aren't very controversial, but some of them really are. So, for example, in 2016, the, the abolishing of maintenance grants for university students, that was pretty controversial, and it was just done through a statutory instrument. Um, it is seen as a way of a government avoiding parliamentary scrutiny, which is a really important role of parliament. And it's, it's kind of seen as going back to your, your Henry VIII and the like, and, and government just kind of doing, well, we can do what we like, and we, this is a mechanism, we'll do it, and we'll avoid just passing new legislation, which is also the stuff that's there already. And about two thirds of bits of secondary legislation just, just go through, they become law without being debated or looked at in any detail by MPs. So democratically, you can argue that's a bit of concern, but the government, uh, the government, the executive is, is elected. Um, and so maybe that defeats some of that. And most of it is is just it's housekeeping. It's kind of we found this hole, this gap in this piece of legislation, and we're going to plug it. Um, but there are those concerns on some of those particular bits. So I, I hope that's um, been helpful. Uh, if it has been, then please uh, hit, hit the like. Um, if you've got any comments or questions, then please leave those below. Uh, again, and please do subscribe. This is part of um, my playlist on A-level politics. There's also a series uh, of pay playlists on bits of, uh, bits of history as well. And the aim of this is to give uh, A-level students uh, the best support possible, but also uh, uh, hopefully it'll be informative uh, and worth watching for people who aren't studying it, who just want to know a bit more, a bit more about how the UK political system works, or how various bits of history, what, what's happening in various bits of history. Thank you very much for watching.